Welcome everyone to another exciting Wu Yu event. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu and I am your host for this evening and the founder of Wu University. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Jen Harthen is a graduate of ICO and after completing a residency in cornea and contact lenses, she became full-time faculty. She is now a professor at ICO and the chief of the Cornea Center for Clinical Excellence at the Illinois Eye Institute. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the Scleral Lens Society and serves on the medical advisory board for the International Keratoconus Academy. She's a founding member of the SCOPE uh, research team, which is an incredible resource. I hope you mentioned that at least once or twice throughout the event. It's such an incredible initiative. And Dr. Jen Harthen not only is a wonderful clinician, she's a great researcher and just a truly incredible person to have on this event. We're really honored to have you tonight, Dr. Harthen. I'm really excited to learn from you. Thank you so much for that great introduction. It really is such an honor to be here with everyone. And for those of you who attend, who are attending, thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedules. I know that you're in busy practices uh, to spend an hour of your time with us to talk about scleral lens fitting. And when I was putting this together, I wanted to do something a little bit different rather than just doing a lecture about scleral lenses and fitting, really wanted to do kind of an interactive event. So I want participation if you're willing. Um, and we're going to start off just by kind of introducing a few things, but then we're going to go through the process of fitting a few patients. Um, and I want you to help me select lenses for these patients. We'll talk about the troubleshooting process. So as we get into the actual fitting process, um, feel free to type in um, your comments and questions and Dr. Wu will um, definitely help us out there. And a huge thank you um, to Dr. Stephanie Wu. She's awesome. Her whole team has been so great to work with, but thank you for helping put this on and for providing CE for all of us. I think this is a great way for all of us to gather together and to learn from each other. Um, I'm not sitting here saying that I am you know, know everything about scleral lenses, but I love to learn and I love to help others. Um, so I'm just excited to be here. And also thank you to Metro Optics um, for providing an educational grant for this to happen. So as we're going through this evening's discussion, we kind of want to talk about some of the benefits of scleral lenses. Why do these work? Why are they beneficial for patients, not only for corneal regularity, but also for those patients who maybe have had some type of corneal surgery and those patients who have ocular surface issue, how and why do they work? We want to talk about some of the latest prescribing and fitting trends that we've seen in the research. And then as we're going through the fitting process, we want to talk about why are we selecting a certain lens? How do we select our first lens? Um, and we'll talk about that process. And then we'll also discuss some troubleshooting techniques um, through our case discussions. Um, but I'm really excited for our discussion this evening. And I hope by the end of it that you are able to take one or two things back into practice tomorrow um, when you're seeing your patients. Um, at the end, I have my email. I always love to hear from people. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. But I think one of the ways in which we get better at um, serving our patients is just by communicating with each other. And so that's what hopefully tonight is all about. So just as a review, you know, what are scleral lenses and why are they so great? Um, I always, I spend a lot of my time in the clinic with students and residents, and I always tell them there are a couple of things that I really kind of get geeked out about. Um, and one of them is scleral lenses. I think that they are so fascinating. When I was a student, I didn't have the opportunity to really work with them a whole lot. It wasn't until residency. And then afterwards, we really got to see how these lenses worked and the design of them. And what do they do for these patients and how do they really benefit these patients? And if we think about a scleral lens, they're different than, you know, our rigid corneal lenses. They're much larger. They vault over the entire cornea and the limbus, and then they land on the sclera. And remember, they're filled with that fluid. So that fluid you know, helps protect and bathe the surface and helps heal the surface of the ocular surface. And there are so many great lenses out there 
and there are different proprietary designs. And when we work with different labs, they may have, you know, different options in terms of how we manipulate the designs, but just kind of to get it in our minds that they really have kind of three main zones when we talk about how we fit them and how we modify and troubleshoot. Remember that kind of the center part of the lens is the optical zone and the optical zone kind of houses the optics. And that's what really kind of starts to clear that center part of the cornea. And then we have the transition zone, which is B that you can see in this image here. And B is kind of the junction between the optic zone that then goes into the landing zone. And we might hear that termed other um, names such as, you know, the limbal zone. Um, and then our landing zone is really what uh, lands onto the sclera. You might also hear that reference to peripheral curves. But when we're talking about how we modify and what we're assessing, these are kind of the three zones, the three parts of the anatomy of a scleral lens. So who benefits from a scleral lens or what types of patients are we going to fit? And so I have been fortunate to work with a fabulous group on some research and looking at what are the indications for scleral lenses? And there are so many indications from vision correction um, to ocular surface, to corneal irregularity, to pro-surgical, and the list is extensive. Um, I'm sure in your practice, you have so many different types of patients that you fit with scleral lenses. And I think the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that while there are so many indications, these, these patients really can benefit from them. We also want to just keep in mind um, when we're talking to our patients, we want to really kind of set their expectations that yes, these can do so much for them, but they're also not necessarily curative that these patients also may need other therapy or, you know, if we're fitting these patients for corneal irregularities, such as keratoconus, that the lenses aren't going to do anything to stop the progression that, you know, these patients would benefit from corneal cross-linking first and then be fit with scleral lenses. So I think that's a really important conversation to have with some of our patients is that, yes, these lenses are great. Um, these devices are great, um, but it may not solve the entire issue that they're often used in conjunction with other therapy. So kind of looking at what are the trends in fitting scleral lenses? Are they primarily fit for corneal irregularity or ocular surface disease or uncomplicated refractive? Or I think a lot of it depends on the practice setting in which you work. Um, but we sent out two surveys um, several years apart, but it kind of matched what was already previously in the literature. And that corneal irregularity is still by far the number one indication for which sclerals are prescribed, followed by ocular surface disease and then refractive error. And then looking at how often these or how often these patients are wearing their lenses and how long, you know, they're wearing them most days a week uh, for many hours throughout the day. Um, some of these patients do have some midday fogging um, and you know, the great thing about them is that while they may have some subjective complaints, we can manage these and that there really are no major long-term complications. Yes, we're still learning more about some of the long-term effects, but there aren't really any major complications as long as their disease is managed. And along with providing improved vision, these devices provide protection to the ocular surface by with that pulse fluid reservoir. They heal the surface. They can improve quality of life, with, which I think is so um, important. I think that's so rewarding for what we get to do when you get that wow factor from a patient where they're giving you that kind of hug or high five or that thank you letter. I think there's nothing that's more rewarding than that. And then also improved comfort. Um, sometimes this can delay or avoid surgical intervention. Um, this may be the um, only option um, before they have another surgery. So there's so many great benefits for these. Um, so what, you know, we kind of think about and how we're going to select our initial lens, there's kind of two methodologies. And when we look at different diagnostic fitting sets, sometimes they combine these, right? So we want to look at 
diameter, perhaps we select our initial lens diameter based on the patient's corneal diameter, or maybe it's because of indication and indication, meaning does the patient need more of a prolate shaped lens, or do they need more of an oblate such as when they've had like a post graft or their post refractive surgery, or those marginal generations where the prolate shape would do well for those patients with corneal ectasia or ocular surface. What we're seeing more and more of now is that not only do we understand so much more about the corneal shape, but we also have technology available to look at the scleral shape. We know that the sclera is not symmetric, it's asymmetric, that we can have toricity um, in the sclera, we can have irregular scleras. Um, so by really understanding the shape of the ocular surface, we're able to select our lenses and the patient have better outcomes. So in terms of selecting diameter, some patients um, you know, are fit with smaller diameter lenses. And we know that smaller diameters often have shallower depths. And this is important from re uh, literature that's been um, published. Dr. Mishad and Dr. Fidel tell us that a shallower, shallower um, sagittal depth, um, we want to do that with a higher decare material um, and less center thickness because we will then minimize um, hypoxia that effects that we will see to the cornea. Also by having a smaller lens that helps reduce the lens mass and improve centration. So these are certain things to think about um, when we're selecting not only our initial lens, but perhaps if we're seeing issues in our fit, maybe if the lens is not centering well, or if we are having other problems where maybe we have excessive clearance in one area, or the patient is having problems with hypoxia, or maybe they already have corneal scarring and neovascularization. These are things to consider when we're doing our fitting process. Also patients with smaller fissures, they often need smaller lenses. Um, they sometimes have a hard time applying lenses when they have a really small fissure. Um, this is particularly true in patients who have cicatricial disease. Um, we need to select a lens that they can easily apply between the lids. Um, and sometimes, you know, we talk about the larger lenses need those advanced landing zone options, uh, torix or quadrant specified peripheral systems, but even the smaller diameters uh, need that as well to really help the patients function well. That often helps sometimes with our midday fogging. It helps just center the lens really well. And most of the fitting sets now um, have those torque landing zone options just in their fitting sets. In terms of larger diameter selection, that's beneficial for patients who have the more severe ocular surface issues. Um, some of those patients also have more conjunctival irregularity. When we have a larger lens, it covers more surface area, so it's able to rehabilitate that ocular surface that's damaged. We also have more distribution of the weight of the scleral lens onto the actual sclera. But sometimes when we have a larger lens, we also have a higher post lens tear vault. So that's one thing to look at as well, is that maybe do we fit that lens a little bit looser or do we have to modify it a little bit more in terms of the overall sagittal height and that transition zone? When we go larger, we also have less lid interaction. So therefore the patient is gonna have enhanced comfort. But then too, when we go larger, we need more of those advanced uh, toric and quadrant specified sometimes uh, landing zones. So who do we fit with these devices? Patients who have moderate to severe ectasia, ocular surface issues, highly irregular, they're highly customizable. So many patients benefit from sclerals. There are so many great educational resources, not only for practitioners, but for patients. Uh, they provide great vision and comfort. But again, we also have to just kind of think about, is this the best option for a patient? I mean, I love fitting them. I think that they are a great resource, but we also just have to talk to our patients about how the handling is a little bit different, how you have to apply and remove them differently than other lenses, that it does take a little bit of time to really understand the fitting and the troubleshooting. There is some investment in time and money for both the patients and the practitioner. And we have to just be a little bit cautious when we're refitting some patients, especially, you know, corneal GP wearers, where there's some um, corneal molding, um, as well as patients who have old grafts. 
And then we have to also kind of just look at some of the literature and the effects of scleral lens where on IOP, the results are mixed, I'll say, and some of the patients that we've been seeing haven't seen that scleral lenses have caused an increase in IOP, but our patients who have uh, both glaucoma and are wearing scleral lenses, we just watch them a little bit closer and really communicate with their glaucoma specialist. So again, obviously, we would love a perfect, perfect lens, great landing, but sometimes that's not always the case, right? So when it's not always the case, what are we going to do? So as we move forward into tonight's discussion, uh, we're going to specifically talk about one particular lens, right? There are a lot of great lenses, but we're really going to focus on one lens and we're going to walk through how to fit. Uh, what is going to be our initial lens selection and how are we going to modify it? And the lens that we're gonna use is we're gonna use the Insight lens. And just some options that we have, it's prolate or oblate. Um, it has center distance multifocal, can do bitoric design, torque landing zone, notching, quadrant specific, so lots of different options. So just kind of keep that in mind as we're moving forward throughout our discussion. Um, and uh, when we're ready for your feedback, um, Dr. Wu will help uh, call out your answers. Um, but let's get going with some of the cases, but I wanted us just to kind of have a brief review uh, so that we're all kind of thinking about the same thing, as I know we all kind of came th uh, from different, uh, different types of days today. So this is our first patient. So I'm sure that we've all seen many patients like this, where he is coming in complaining of constant blurry vision in the left eye, more so than the right eye. He was actually referred from ophthalmology, um, has worn corneal GPs uh, more than four years prior, and his main issue was that he always lost a lens, right? Um, that he would have it and it would work for a little bit. The vision was good. Comfort was so-so, but his problem was that the lens kept popping off. And if you take a look, part of the issue is that he is a constant left XT. So that might be part of the reason why he kept losing a lens. Um, one of the questions that we always like to ask is, when were you diagnosed? Um, and do you have any family history? Um, he's diagnosed with keratoconus in 2005. Um, and he does not have any family history and just some seasonal allergies. So taking more, a uh, closer look at some more of his examination data, um, corrected acuities coming in, and this is uh, with his current glasses. Uh, it was 20, 25ths and 24 hundredths, and trying to pinhole didn't work the greatest, um, but pinhole was about 2100. Uh, with the new manifest about 2020 and 2070, and what's interesting, when we think about some of our patients who have more cornea irregularity, we expect there to be more astigmatism, but for some reason, he kicked out all of it. So now when we take a look at his uh, slit lamp um, examination, uh, his normal, both on the lids and the lashes, um, he has some one plus injection kind of uh, more temporally, but also kind of just kind of overall, just not, you know, the happiest looking eyes. Um, and we're looking at the cornea. He has some apical thinning, a Fleischer ring in both corneas. And then that left eye has a pretty pronounced Munson sign, right? When the patient's looking down, you can see that protrusion of the cornea. Um, and then everything else was pretty unremarkable. If we take a look at the patient's tomography, um, so tomography again is going to give us information about the posterior cornea and the anterior cornea. And I think when we're managing patients with disease specifically of the cornea, it's, it's helpful to have that information um, so that we can monitor for progression. Also to look at corneal thickness. And here is the patient's right and left eye. We can see that they're different. The left eye is definitely more advanced than the right eye. Um, so the patient's K's for the right eye are about 42 and a half by 45. And the left eye is 54.2 by about 55.2. The other thing that's helpful is to look at the patient's HVID or what on uh, Pentacam, it's the horizontal white to white. 
And for the right eye, it was about 12.5, and then the left eye is 12.3. And again, why that information is helpful so that we can select our initial lens. Also, in looking at the elevation maps, um, we want to look at the difference between the highest point and the lowest point, because that's going to help us when we're initially selecting a lens. Um, you know, if we have a patient for the first time, are they going to do well with a corneal GP or do they need to go on to something else where maybe that corneal GP is not stable? And if we have greater than 325 microns difference, then that corneal GP may not be as stable. Um, so we can see that we have a difference in that left eye, um, but the right eye was um, more st uh, stable, less elevation differences. And then also looking at corneal uh, thickness, uh, the right eye is 423 microns and left eye is 338 microns. So a couple of things looking there. And then also here's just kind of a summary of what we discussed. Also, I like to look at the tangential map just to see the size of the uh, ectasia. Um, and we can see that the left is a little bit larger than the, the right. They are pretty centered. The right one may be a little bit decentered, but then also looking at that elevation map to help us in our lens selection. So let's start our lens fitting process. So how do we begin? Well, the nice thing about a lot of our diagnostic fitting uh, sets is that it tells you where to start, right? So we have two options. We can do prolate or oblate. And we start prolate for those patients who are ectatic, um, post-lasic ectasia, who have high elevation corneas. And for this particular lens, it tells us to start with a prolate SAG lens of 5,000. Whereas if it was an oblate, so those patients who are post-surgical, um, LASIK, pellucid marginal degeneration, we're going to start with an oblate 4750. Okay, so if we take a look again at our patient's corner, remember he was more prolate. So my question for you is, where do you want to start? All right, everyone, now is your chance to put your vote into the chat box on which lens you want to try first. And then based off of what we see, as far as what you put in the chat box, we will figure out which lens to begin with. So go ahead and put your uh, thoughts or comments in the chat box on what lens do you want Dr. Harthen to put on this patient first? What do you want to see on this patient's eye? So we have tons of votes for 5,000. So can we start there? Sure. So, right, so the fitting the fitting guy says start 5,000. So even if we don't know, that's a great place to start. So let's start there. All right, so let's put this lens on. And um, again, I have some great students and residents helping us out here, getting that lens on. And it, also have the patient help you out when you're putting these on. Have them pull down their lower lid. You grab their upper lid. Um, let them do some work too, but let's look at this lens. All right, so here's the lens that we put on. I think it's always helpful when you're putting the lens on for the first time to fill that lens with fluorescein. Uh, make sure that you fill it all the way full. If you're having a hard time with application, you can also use a more viscous solution uh, so that you don't have as many application bubbles. Um, but this is what our first lens looks like. I like to look at it with a blue light diffuse and then do white light optic section. And to look at those three zones, start centrally. And you wanna kind of judge the ratio of the lens to the central fluid reservoir. And we kind of want that one-to-one -one or a little bit less. Now the thickness of this lens is about 250 microns, okay? So that's what we want. And then we go to that transition zone we want there to be just kind of perceptible fluorescein. So we can see about 50 to 100 microns of fluorescein there. And then I think a good way to really judge the landing zone is we want that landing zone to look like a well-fitting soft lens. That's kind of how I think of it is you want to kind of make your beam a little bit wider. And we're going to look all the way around. And you don't want to forget about that superior area, right? Have the patient look down, lift up at that upper lid. We want it to look like a well-fitting soft, soft lens. We don't want there to be any lift off. We don't want there to be any compression or impingement. 
Um, and we also don't want these lenses to move, right? They shouldn't be moving all over the place. If they're moving all over the place, we need to make an adjustment. So based on what you're seeing here, what do you think? Do we have that one-to-one -one ratio? We have a little bit more. Do you want more information? What do you think? So Dr. Gamo says a little too much clearance. I would agree with you. Okay. And now it's nice if your practice has an anterior sago CT. It's fantastic if you have that, but not every practice is going to. Um, but what we also want to do is after we take a look at the fluorescein is let's take a look at that landing zone. Okay. What are we thinking of this landing zone? Are we happy with this? We can see the different quadrants. Now, to me, it doesn't look horrible, right? Just initially, um, there might be a little bit of impingement starting, um, but to me, it's like, eh, not too bad. Now, the one thing too is I will definitely say that I'll be the first one to admit I have made so many mistakes in fitting lenses, and I have learned so much from fitting those, and that one of the mistakes that I have made and I've made repeatedly is that I strive for perfection and you're not always going to get perfection. What I've started to do now is think, is this lens dispensable? Meaning is the patient comfortable? Can they see? And is this lens doing no harm to the surface of the eye? So if I've checked all those boxes, then I usually consider it a win and I stop chasing perfection because sometimes when I chase perfection, I just create more problems. So that's something that I have learned and sometimes I'm still learning, um, but that's one of the questions that I ask is, is this lens dispensable? So if I was just looking at this landing zone, I would say, yeah, not so bad. But I would agree that our central one-to-one -one ratio, it wasn't a one-to-one, -one, it was probably a bit more. The nice thing is that we do have an anterior sago CT, and look at that, over 700 microns of clearance. So it's kind of a lot, right? So in this case, probably wouldn't dispense this lens. So my question now is, what do you want to put on next? All right, guys, your chance to vote. And we did have a few votes come in already, but now that you've seen the 5,000 sag on the eye, and now you've seen the clearance, and now you've seen the OCT, what would you like to try next? I love the participation. Thank you for getting into yeah, this. Yeah, my gosh, Thank you so, so much. So many votes. It's exciting. So I think the winner of the votes is 4,500. All right, let's try it. Let's try it on. Okay, so here's what we see. So um, hopefully you can see all the images okay. Um, but what we have here is we have the central fluid reservoir, right? And that looks a little bit closer to that one-to-one. -one. You know, sometimes too, we don't want to make our initial assessment right after we apply the lens. We want that lens to settle a bit. And sometimes after the patient has worn their lenses for a period of time, that lens looks completely different than when you dispense it. Um, so I think it's very helpful to have the patient wear their lenses for at least two to four hours before they come in for their follow-up appointment. I also think it's very beneficial to remove the lens and apply stain to the surface at follow-ups. So you can really see what's happening to the surface, right? We're not just fitting lenses, we're treating a disease. So we want to take a look at the surface. Do we have any staining? Do we have staining on the conjunctiva, which maybe means that we have a steep landing zone? Do we have staining on the cornea, which would mean that we have uh, bearing or touch, or is it because maybe they have a solution toxicity? So I think that's also really important to do. So just taking a look here, we can see that, yeah, our central, you know, ratio looks a little bit better, but when looking at the landing zone, um, 
this one, you know, I think what's helpful is sometimes you don't always see those bubbles coming in. If we have a little bit of lift off, one thing that you can do is ask the patient, how does it feel? If they can feel it right away, that usually tells you that you have some edge lift. If they don't feel it right away, but then as they wear it, it becomes uncomfortable. That usually tells you that you have a tighter landing zone. Um, but sometimes also, if you're looking for a edge lift, look for a shadow at that edge. And if you see a shadow, then that's telling you usually that you have um, some lift off. So maybe some lift off, but then also if we kind of look at this blood vessel um, superiorly, that we can see that we don't have any impingement and it's nice to kind of pick a blood vessel and watch it. But again, if you look at this horizontal meridian, specifically temporally, you can kind of start to see how maybe we're getting some whitening um, at the blood vessels and some compression there. So that's just kind of something to watch. So here again is our um, anterior seg OCT of the lens. Um, and what we're seeing is oh, here we have about 110 microns. So, I don't know, is this something that you want to dispense or do you want to try something different? Do you want to order from now? What are your thoughts about this lens here? So everybody get your chat boxes out and uh, based off of this information now that Dr. Harthens presented, would you dispense the lens or would you want, would you like to try something else? And we'll see what everybody's saying. So we have a few votes for dispense. We've got a few votes saying try 4750, uh, more clearance, increase the sag by a hundred. So I think, uh, why don't we try something a little bit with more sag? Yeah. And I don't think necessarily that there's a right or a wrong answer here. I think we could go so many different ways. And we know, as I'm sure, you, you, sure all of you do, every patient is going to respond a little bit differently. Every patient's conge is a little bit different. It's a little bit more spongy, less spongy. So I do want to show you what happened after a couple of hours of wear. So we let this one go. And look what happened. So we have complete touch and we have more compression. So sometimes I think it's confusing on what is actually impingement versus what is compression. And they're both whitening of the tissue. But when we talk about compression, that's proximal of the landing zone. Um, that's kind of when the heel of the landing zone is digging in. Whereas impingement is where the very edge of the toe is digging in with compression. When initially placed on the eye, the patients may experience lens awareness. However, that's going to decrease as the lens settles. Um, so to resolve that, what we would do is we would steepen the scleral landing zone to achieve a more even lens distribution. So just for fun, because we're here and we heard that some people wanted to try on the 440, uh, 750 SIG, that's what we're going to do. All right, so here is our uh, 4750 prolate lens. And while we have more fluorescein, right? The one thing also that we can kind of see is that at the transition zone, that limbal area, we don't have as much fluorescein. Now, the one thing that I would caution all of us is that when we're using our blue light, is to really kind of be careful because sometimes that is actual shadow versus it really being more bearing. So really to assess that, we want to do an optic section. Um, but here we have about 522 microns of central clearance. And then what we're seeing as the lens settles, what do we think of this? Are we happy with this? Do we want to make any modifications? What are your thoughts on this particular aspect here? Yeah, decentration. Yeah, good clearance, just some mild inferior decentration. I agree with you. Yeah, so I'm happy with the clearance here, um, but the decentration, and sometimes we can do decentration for, 
you know, several reasons, you know, sometimes it can be because of the diameter of the lens. Sometimes it can be because of the sag. Sometimes we have to add more touristy to that landing zone to help with the centration. Um, what we can also see when we look at the landing zone is we're getting a little bit of that impingement where that very outer edge of the lens is pinching into that conjunctiva. And to help with that, what we want to do is we want to flatten that scleral landing zone. And remember, again, we can do this in different meridians, and we can also do this in different quadrants as well. So let's say that we just see impingement in this particular meridian. We can just change it in that meridian. Okay. Anything else that you want to see? Or are we happy with this now? I think I'm pretty happy. Yeah, that's a great question. Will we push the contact lens up? Of Yes, I think that's a great idea to really push it up to observe the edge. Yes, that's often what we do to really see what's happening. Yes, fantastic. Another question is to use a rattan filter to enhance the fluorescein pattern. Yeah, um, but to really quantify what you're seeing um, is you want to use an optic section white light. So make it as thin as possible, bump up your mag. So yes, just kind of use your blue light overall, but really to quantify, you want to use your white light optic section. Thank you so much for your participation. This is great. Sometimes when we do these like technology things, I get a little bit nervous that it's not gonna work. So thank you. All right, so then you can kind of think about what are you gonna order, right? What do we wanna do for our, our SAG? Do we want that 4750? And then with our power, doing an over refraction, the diameter, so this lens, it starts at a 15.6, but you can go all the way up to an 18 millimeter. I was happy with that. And then the landing zone, we definitely want to incorporate that touristy. All right, let's go on to our second case. So this one is a little bit different. So this patient, again, um, similar complaints in that constant blurry vision was referred from another provider, has a history of scleral lens wear, and is actually coming in wearing those scleral lenses. And the thing that he's stating is that he has painted redness when he removes his lenses. Um, he wears his lenses for about 10 to 12 hours per day, not really any fogging. Um, he's using a peroxide-based solution to fill his lenses and preservative-free solution to fill his lenses. He's not sure how old his current lenses are. Um, he's worn both uh, uh, rigid corneal lenses and hybrids in the past. He has a tendency to sleep in his lenses. So compliance, not the greatest, no family history of keratoconus and also has some seasonal allergies. So here's his entering vision with his current sclerals, 2020 in the right eye, 2050 in the left. He's doing great. He's really doing pretty well. Uh, manifest, he's about 2080 in the right 2150. Um, and then he has some more astigmatism um, in that left eye than the right, but it's pretty, pretty equal. And now let's take a look at his examination findings. Um, and uh, sometimes these patients can be a little bit challenging when they're already coming in wearing lenses. Um, and he was pretty injected, more so the right eye than the left eye. Um, he is post intacts. So any of you who have managed patients who have intacts, um, they're not the easiest, um, but he uh, had intacts. He has two segments on the right cornea, none on the left. Um, no knee vascularization. Overall, the cornea is pretty clear. Um, but I think the challenge for him in particular is that his current lenses, just causing him some discomfort. And then how do you transition him from his current lenses to a new design. So this is our patient. Um, and what do you think? Does he look pretty happy? Um, he really is like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, he's wearing these because he loves the vision, but I don't know if you can even see in this picture in the photo, but you can see that his lenses are decentered. And if you can see how injected, particularly that red temporal conjunctiva is, um, and he said it kind of stays like that. Um, he's a single dad and he's working two jobs. Um, so he needs to be able to see, um, to be able to um, provide for his young daughter. Yeah. Lovely conj, right? Um, it's, 
uh, pretty uh, inflamed. So if we take a look at his tomography, now he's a little bit more advanced than our last patient. Um, his cornea has flattened a little bit on that right because of the intacts, but his left cornea is 68 by 71. So we're just gonna focus on his right eye. Um, so even though he's had intacts, he still has that central elevated ectasia, right? So he's still more prolate. Um, and if you take a look too, he's, his ectasia is pretty large right? So he's got a pretty large ectasia. Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the questions, comments was if he, his cone is more central, moving him to a corneal GP to uh, reduce some of that injection. And we had kind of considered that as well. But one of our concerns was with intact and his non-compliance is, you know, would that cause irritation to the cornea and what to do? So we discussed lots of options with him and we went round and round, but we eventually just decided to proceed with a new scleral. Um, and there are many ways to approach these patients and not to say that our way is always the best way, um, but just a way to approach it. Um, so with him, uh, here is his current lens. And if you look at it, you can see how that landing zone is like digging in and also how much excessive clearance he has. Um, and the one thing too, is that, you know, who knows what happened? You know, maybe this lens was his lens prior to him having the surgery. So before this might have looked really well. Um, but I think what we also want to do is, you know, in a perfect situation, maybe we keep the patient out of the lens and then refit after, especially if we were doing uh, like a free form fitting where we're using, um, our, uh, you know, a corneal scleral profile to help us fit this lens. You know, if we have a garbage in, they're going to get garbage out, but for some patients, particularly this patient, that's not always an option. So we then need to explain to them that several modifications may be needed and compliance is really important, really set up their expectations so that they have the best outcome. And then again, here is his other lens as well. So again, we're going to start fitting a lens. And my question for you is, where would you like to start? So get out your chat boxes again and help Dr. Harthen pick a lens for the right eye. Well, it seems like most people are picking 5,000 or 5,500. Awesome. You know, the other thing too is, you know, we have the option of a torix. We have the SAG with the toric haptic. So maybe we want to start there. So yes, the fitting guide tells us to start with that 5,000 SAG, but maybe let's start with that toric haptic and see what that looks like. So let's try it. All right. So here's what we see. All right, so again, kind of looking centrally, are we happy with this clearance? Taking a look at that transition zone, we can see that we do have some clearance. And I don't know if you can see that landing zone, but it's getting a little tight. What do we wanna do? Do we wanna keep this one or we wanna try something different? Yeah, I think most people would agree to try something different. And, you know, part of the reason too, why we say is always take the lens off is here is what his conge is looking like, right? So part of this is probably from his old lens, but two, just from wearing the lens, if we were to leave this on, that would probably cause more damage to the surface and the conge. And we don't want that to have lasting effects. So question for you next is what lens do you want to do next? We had the 5,000 toric on. Um, do we want to try which one next? We have too much. So which one do we want to do next? What do you think, doctor? What are you seeing? Looks like we've got some votes for 
which one would you like to go with? Well, just for fun, let's go with the 4750. I like it. Let's do it. All right. So here's our 4750. Okay. So we can see that we have probably a little bit less clearance, less vault. Um, but also we're still getting some of that digging in. Now, again, it's not perfect. Part of that's probably from inflamed conge before, um, but it looks like that's kind of digging in and causing then the conge to come on over, but that is a, not a happy conjunctiva. So if we're kind of judging just me looking at the ratio of the lens thickness to the post fluid lens reservoir, I have about a one to two ratio here. And if I want to confirm with an anterior sago CT, I have about 600 microns of clearance. And if I look at that transition zone and landing zone, we can see that we have excessive there. So do we want to try on another lens? Do we want to order from here? We could do either, right? You could just simply lower the sag or you could um, try another lens. There's no, again, right or wrong. You can kind of do it however you want. Since we're here and we're doing a fitting, let's try on the next lower sag, right? If we have too much, we want to go down. So let's put on that 4,500 just to see what it looks like. All right, so again, here it looks better, right? We have less central clearance, but now maybe that landing zone and that horizontal meridian, we're getting some edge lift. So we want, we want to take a look at that superior and inferior uh, meridian to see if we're getting the same. Does that patient need that same landing zone 360 or do we need more of that toric or quadrant specific? Okay. And here we have about 429. Okay. So what do you want to do next? Do you want to try on another lens or do you want to order from here? And you can do whatever you want. Order, yeah, I'd probably order as well, right? You can order from here. And we would order, right? What sake? So think about what... What are you going to order? Are you going to do the 4,500? Do you want to do a 4,400? Look at that diameter, 15.6. Look maybe a little bit small. I might go to that 16.0. And then that landing zone, we can do tor tor toric or we can do quadrant specific. And again, probably have to make changes on him just because his conjunctiva was so inflamed to begin with. All right. And then here is his left lens just for fun so that you can see how that looked. All right, last case, a little bit different case. This is one for ocular surface. Uh, the patient is 33 year old female who has had dryness that's progressed over the last few years is a soft torque contact lens uh, where who only averages about three hours of wear because she spends all of her day at the computer. And then they tend to uh, rotate and vision fluctuates. Um, she's diabetic, has rheumatoid arthritis, has allergies. And here you can see everything that she has tried in the past. Vision is okay. Um, she has more sill in the right eye compared to the left. And when we take a look at her uh, exam. She has some MGD, the wiper epitheliopathy. She has a positive core blackie. So she has leg up thalamus. She's got lysamine stain. She's got corneal staining. And here we can see her dry eye testing. She's got a high OSDI. Her osmolarity is asymmetric. She's got a mildly positive inflammatory in the one eye. Her shermers are a little low and she does have some atrophy on her mybography. Now, looking at her tomography, you know, she just has some astigmatism. Um, her Ks are pretty average. Her Ks are about 42 by 45 in the one eye and 43 by 44 in the other. So her corneas are relatively normal. So again, here it tells you to start with the prolate 5,000, but 
when we have more of that normal cornea, that may be too much, okay? So for her, where would you like to start? She doesn't have ectasia, she's more normal. So we have one couple 4,000. Lots of 4,000s. Sure, we can. I like the one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You guys are great. All right, so let's go with four thousand. Let's start there. All right, here it is. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want that one. Whoops. What do we want next? 4250 is the next vote. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we have some clearance centrally. It might look a little thin. Um, lens is a little bit small on her with our standard diameter. So she probably needs a larger lens. Um, and then also when we did our optic section, the lens was starting to hit at that transition zone in the limbus. So it was getting a little bit thin and video of her lens and you can barely see the fluorescein. So even though it's better than the 4,000, it's really thin, right? At, when we start to get like just past the pupil and then to the limbus. So it's pretty thin. And our anterior seg OCT kind of shows us that where we have a little bit of clearance but it's not ideal. We only have about 97 microns. And you can see this smaller diameter and hitting the limbus. So you wanna try another lens or do you wanna order? I think we should try the 4,500. I like it. All right, so better. It looks better. We have better clearance, uh, maybe a little bit of edge lift from the shadowing, from the tears pumping up underneath the landing zone, but much better. When we do our video here, again, it might be a little bit thin at the limbus and that at the mid peripheral zone, but by making that lens larger, that's gonna help give us more clearance. So when we look, we have about 420 microns of clearance. So I don't think we necessarily need to change the sagittal height. What I think we need to do is more change the diameter of the lens. And that should help us land more appropriately. So just to kind of summarize how she's doing with the lens, just thought I'd share it with you, her experience. Um, so just a couple of questions. Can you tell me how the lenses are feeling? They're feeling comfortable. And have you been able to wear them for most of the day or do you feel like you're having to take them out? No, we wear them most of the day, feels good. And can you tell me how it's been in terms of the dryness? I know we're using these not only to correct your vision, but tell me a little bit about what this has done for your dryness. It's helped enough that I don't have to use my drops that often, especially when I'm working with a computer. Great, thanks so much. So sometimes we want more of a wow factor, but that's like as excited as she gets. Um, but she just really, this has really helped her function throughout her day. Um, and uh, let's just kind of just summarize our evening discussion. I really want to thank you for your participation. I hope that you found that a little bit enjoyable to kind of share in the fitting experience. Um, you know, there are so many different ways that we can modify lenses, that we can fit lenses. And we went through three different cases where we can really enhance patients' lives by improving their vision and their comfort and their ocular health. We have so many different customizations that we can do to these um, to enhance their outcomes. And sometimes we you know, don't always get it right on the very first lens that sometimes we have to make multiple modifications, um, you know, looking at corneal diameter and the patient's indication prior to lens selection can help us be successful. And really, you know, it's okay to not have all the answers. That's why, you know, utilizing technology, taking photos and videos and 
working with consultation and emailing them and calling them um, to see what their opinion is too, because they really know um, how to help modify and great resources like this, you know, again, huge thank you to Dr. Wu for putting programs like this together. Um, I think that's a great resource that we have, especially, you know, during these times to be able to do these virtually. Um, so I just want to really thank you for your time this evening and for your participation. I think we have a few minutes for some questions, um, but then also too, here's my email. If you have any questions or comments later on, I'm always just happy to chat about cases and um, yeah, so thank you. Awesome, Dr. Harthen. That was amazing. This was our very first interactive webinar where people could participate in the chat box. And I think that people really, really enjoyed this event. So